Okay. A'ud billahi min ash-shaytan rajim. Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, dear brothers and sisters, to today's webinar entitled Mahar Mahrams and Walis by Sheikh Musleh Khan in conjunction with PureMatrimony.com and also in association with SalatTimes.com. My name is Arfa Sarah Iqbal and I'm head of operations and marketing at Pure Matrimony and inshallah I'll be hosting today's call. Alhamdulillah, we are delighted and honored to have Sheikh Musleh Khan here with us today. And for those of you who don't know already, Sheikh Musleh was born in the land of the Prophet Sallallahu in Medina, Saudi Arabia and grew up in Toronto, Canada, where he developed a strong love for basketball and was chosen as part of the starting lineup for five years in high school. He then later graduated as student council president in 1998. He went on to pursue a diploma in computer programming, programming analysis at York University, which then led to an acceptance at the University of Medina in 2002, where he spent approximately 10 years studying under various scholars and acquired a broad understanding of Islamic sciences, including fiqh, hadith, tafsir, and aqidah. Sheikh Musleh travels to many parts of the world, including Australia, Europe, and other parts of Canada to deliver lectures on Islam and Muslims to a variety of different audiences. In addition to this, he has appeared on worldwide Islamic TV networks, including Islam Channel and Ramadan TV. Sheikh Musleh is committed to spreading a message of simplicity and spiritual upliftment through knowledge and etiquettes to Muslims that empowers them and helps them to integrate into the broader community. Sheikh Musleh is currently the Director of Education at the Khalid bin Walid Mosque in Toronto, Canada, where he conducts regular classes and lectures. He enjoys long-distance running, basketball, and loves to read and write in addition to spending time with his family in Toronto, where he and his wife reside. Inshallah, today the topic is a much-requested one on mahars, mahrams, and walis, and I'm really looking forward to sharing the gems that Sheikh Musleh has in store for us all, inshallah. Now, before we actually start, I just want to make a couple of points that are um, very important for everybody, and that is, first of all, a recording will be made because we always get requests for these inshallah so our aim is to try and get them up as quickly as possible we usually say sort of 10 uh, 7 to 10 days after we have uh, finished the webinar inshallah we're going to aim to get that up for you inshallah um, we will also be sending out the slides so everyone who registered will be getting a copy of those um, a final thing that I want to um, say just before we jump into today's webinar is the fact that um, we are having problems with Facebook at the moment where a lot of people who have pressed like and have liked us on Facebook including Sheikh Muslim's Facebook page as well we're not actually showing in their news feeds so what we would kindly request is for everybody if you could please kindly go to your account settings you can manually add us in you need to actually click on um, the Facebook tab which actually says uh, to add us to your interest list so make sure you're adding pure matrimony and also Sheikh uh, Muslim Khan's um, Facebook page to your interest list and inshallah it will show in the news feed otherwise you're not going to have any any updates from us at all um, so okay I think that we're done with the housekeeping so without further ado inshallah I'm gonna pass you over to uh, Sheikh Musleh uh, Asalaamu Alaikum Sheikh are you there? Wa Alaikum As Salaam Wa Rahmatullah Yes I am Oh Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah okay excellent inshallah I'm just gonna make you the presenter inshallah before we start okay Okay, inshallah, let's go. Okay, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. Where you go? Okay, Jazakallah khairan. Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man wala amma ba'd. Rabbi shurah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another fantastic discussion here on purematrimony.com. Today, insha'Allah ta'ala, we are going to be discussing, as you see in front of your screen, the mahar, the mahrams, and the walis. So the dowry, the guardians, and also the guardians in terms of marriages and marriage proposals. So this discussion here is very practical and it's extremely important because right off the bat when you look at the title here, all three of these categories have a lot of problematic issues behind them and unfortunately it's our own Muslim cultures that have attached certain negative stigmas or 
cultural influences on each of these categories which we're going to try to look at and solve them as well tonight insha'Allah ta'ala. So having said that, let's begin with our first discussion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all his wisdom has placed extra protection for women in Islam by giving the men in her life special duties and roles to fulfill. So the mahar, which is, has to be paid by the husband. The mahram, who cannot uh, marry her, but rather acts as a protector for her. And then of course the wali, who is the guardian for her. And each of these categories, as we mentioned, have specific roles, specific guidelines on how to perform and fulfill them. Just a slight note on this wisdom here that we're talking about in the intro. The fact that Allah has placed extra protection on women is absolutely phenomenal. Because even part of who we are as human beings, especially as husbands and as men, it's naturally within us that when we have a daughter, when we have a wife, when we have a mother, we do have that special care that for, for them. We do have that special care and attention over them that, you know, there's certain things that we want to make sure that they're cared for, they're provided for, that we have security. All of these little things that is provided for her, just for her overall protection, as opposed for a male child or a father at to some degree, they have a level of independency where there's certain things that they can take care of by themselves. So we don't really have to worry about them too much. But for the women, we always make sure that we're there to provide that extra security for them. Now let's look at the mahab. This is our first topic, insha'Allah ta'ala. What is the mahab? Now this is, of course, a crucial, crucial part of the discussion in order to understand exactly where we're going to go with this particular discussion. The mahab is the dowry given to the wife by her husband. And this is her right as Allah says in Surah An-Nisa, which is the surah in the verse that we're looking at, verse number four. Allah clearly says, and give, and give the woman uh, upon marriage their gifts graciously. So here, Allah Azza wa Jalla, now that's the point of evidence. Allah orders that uh, the gift be given to the women. So this is not a choice that the man has. And it says here, it is a token of honor and respect for the wife and demonstrates the seriousness and importance of the marriage contract. It is given in exchange for the right to enjoy marital relations. Now just to add to that. So the first thing that we know is that the mahar is obligatory. A mahar has to be agreed upon at the time of marriage. If for whatever reason it wasn't specified, then what will happen is either during the marriage or if the husband passes away even after his death, the woman is given a mahar based on women of her social status. And this is of course something that she inherits or on someone else, a judge or an imam or someone in the local community who has authority takes on that responsibility to make sure that she's given a mahar. That's how important it is. The second thing that I want to mention here is the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal says, and give the women, and give the women uh, their mahar. The fact that Allah says to give the women their mahar, it clearly shows guys that subhanAllah, this is a gift that Allah is giving to the woman. It's almost as if it's something very personal that Allah is saying, look, I want you, the husbands, to do this for me, for, to her. So it's a gift that Allah personally takes upon himself to provide for the woman. That in and of itself makes it so special. It makes it such a special gift. It's more than just a mahar for her. The third point that I want to mention is, here in this particular verse, Allah calls the mahar sadaqat. The word sadaqat in Arabic is derived from sidqun. Sidqun in Arabic literally means to be truthful and to be honest. So the mahar or the dowry is actually the truth of the marriage. What does that mean? It's basically the thing that brings genuineness to the marriage itself. If a guy is going to really go out of his way to give her a gift and make sure that that gift she's happy with it. Because normally what do we do when we give gifts to each other? We kind of do it in a surprise manner. You know, we just hope that when we give the gift, and inshallah the person is going to like it. But maybe deep down inside of their heart, 
it's not really the gift that they would use. It's not really something that they're interested in. But they're just going to be, you know, thank you, Jazakallah Khair, and make themselves happy, and they'll accept the gift for what it is. Not the mahar. The mahar is something that the man has to go out of his way to make sure that the wife is happy with it. So this here, with all that effort, that money, that time that he spends to make sure that he fulfills the mahar itself, it really shows that this guy, he is serious about the mahar. He is serious about the marriage itself, and his commitment to that marriage, inshallah, will be a long-term commitment. So it's really, really, the mahar is a really beautiful, beautiful concept that we have in marriage. Is giving the mahar obligatory? So we've talked about it. Yes, the husband must give the mahar, especially uh, if it's stipulated in, a, in an official marriage contract. However, if the wife withholds his rights to intimacy, she will lose the right of the mahar. Um, also, if the wife chooses to forego any part of the mahar, the husband is permitted to take it as Allah Azza wa Jal says. Now look, this particular verse here continues. But if they, meaning the women, of their own good pleasure, this verse here says, فَإِن طِبْنَ لَكُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ So if the woman, out of her own will, this word طِبْن, Tibin literally means that she's under no pressure whatsoever. So the guy can't be going out with her one day to like a restaurant or something. And when it comes time to pay the bill, the husband like pulls out like 10 bucks and he says to his wife, and it's all, it's all a way to kind, of, um, is to kind of trick her and to kind of encourage her to feel sorry for him. So he pulls out his money and he pulls out like $5 or 5 pounds and he's like, Man, if I didn't have to pay you all, you know, the complete mahar, if I didn't have to pay you all that money, I would have enough money to take you out to more dinners. So what is he doing? He's trying to put this, like, guilt feeling in her. And then as a result, her response to that is, well, you know what? Let's just take off $500 from the mahar so that way, you know, you don't have this hardship upon you. So he wins at the end. She takes off this money. And that's how it works. This here in itself is prohibited as well when it comes to the mahr. Allah says it's from her. She has the one that has to decide if she, out of her own good pleasure, look at the translation at the bottom of the screen there, guys, out of their own good pleasure, remit any part of it. So if she, out of her own good pleasure, decides, you know what? I feel sorry for you, oh my husband. I feel sorry for you that you're going through a tough time, you know, you're mesquite or whatever. So at that point, she's allowed to say to him, look, you don't have to pay me the entire mahar. Look, I'll take $50 off of it. Or here, you don't have to buy me the earrings. You've already bought me, you know, the necklace or the bracelets or something. She can do that on her own. If that happens, as a result, Allah says, فَكُلُوهُ هَنِي أَمَّرِيَا Allah says, and enjoy it without any fear of any harm. In other words, basically, take it and don't say anything about it. Just accept it. So what happens in some cases is that when the husband says, oh, you know, that's so wonderful. You know, you're going to take away 50 bucks or you're not going to put that pressure on me to buy you the extra bracelet. Here, Allah is saying, just take it. And don't complain, don't say anything, don't say, well, you know what, you could also do this for me as well. You could also help me here, you can also discount this. It's almost as if the, the guy is trying to get like a partial mahar refund, if you'd like. So Allah is saying, don't even do this. Whatever she decides to give back to you, accept it and move on. Is the mahar a part of the marriage contract? Although the mahar is obligatory on the husband, and is a right of the wife, it does not actually actually form part of the marriage contract unless stated otherwise. So it's something that you literally have to sit there and make it official, or it can just be a completely uh, a complete verbal agreement. And this is, of course, based on the uh, on this verse in Surah Al-Baqarah. There is no sin. So there is no sin upon you if you divorce women before touching them or assigning uh, for them a dowry. So this means the marriage contract will still be valid without a mahar being mentioned. However, it is preferred to mention and agree upon the mahar at the time of the nikah to avoid any problems or dispute. So it's really important that even though you guys don't specifically have to mention it, once the man knows his responsibility that he has to provide a mahar, he can do that even at a later time. Unfortunately, in our times, brothers and sisters, I'll be very honest with you. This is very risky because a lot of Muslims now just 
don't have that responsibility and that maturity to do something like this. Because the moment if you leave this door open and there's problems now that happen in the marriage, this is something that he probably might throw against her at one point during the marriage and say, you know what, you don't even deserve a maha. You know, you're not good to me, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, or you broke your own promises, so I'm not going to give you no mahar at all. And then it creates a whole different issue in the marriage itself. So what's the best thing to do, guys? Make sure that you agree upon a mahar before the marriage. And if it's, it does not happen before the marriage, make sure that it happens as soon as possible during the marriage itself. And for the husband has to always remember and understand that this is a responsibility he has to fulfill as an order from Allah Azza wa Jal. Can the mahar be taken back? The husband cannot take back the mahar he gave to his wife, if, even if he wishes to divorce her. And this, of course, is based on this particular verse here. And how could you take back uh, when you have gone into, uh, uh, when have you gone in onto each other, and they have taken from you a firm and strong covenant? This verse here, وَكَيْفَ تَأْخُذُونَهُ وَقَدْ أَفْضَى بَعْضُكُمْ إِلَىٰ بَعْضُ how could you find it inside of yourself to take back all of this when you guys have shared something even more deeper than that? When it says that you have gone in onto each other, it's talking about intimacy. Like you've shared something so sacred, so personal with each other. Why on, in addition to that, why is the money, the wealth, the mahar, the furniture, the bed, the this, the that, all of these little things, the house, the cars you bought for her, why are you going to take it back from her? Because this is something that you should just leave her with it. Leave her with it because you guys actually shared something deeper than that, something that has more value than any of these things around you. So this is why Allah Azzawajal says not to take back the mahar from her, leave it with her. Unfortunately, again, even in our times, you see so many Muslims going into the court systems and they battle and they fight because why? Uh, you know, the husband doesn't want to give her a divorce or doesn't want to let her go until she returns the mahar. A husband who does this is sinful in the sight of Allah for doing this. The mahar is the right of the wife alone and it is not permitted for her father or anyone else to take except with her approval. So sisters, those of you who are listening, this is your thing. This belongs to you. You have it, you get to choose it, and you have complete 100% control over it. It's all about you, and the greatest, I guess if you'd like to say, the most beautiful, the most special thing about this is, Wallahi, this is a gift that Allah Himself is presenting to you. Allah Himself took it upon Himself to say, look, give the women this particular gift. Abu Salih once said, when a man married off his daughter, he would take her mahar away from her. But Allah forbade them to do that and gave women the right to the mahar they received. What counts as a mahar? What can be given? So let's get into some of the nitty gritty stuff. There is no minimum, there is no maximum when it comes to the mahar in terms of what is specified in the Quran. There was an example of a companion who did not have any wealth except a piece of a, a like a, a metal ring. And the Prophet Sallallahu told this man, is like, is that all that you own? Just this metal ring? And the man, the companion said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. So the man, the, the Prophet Sallallahu looks at the man and asks him, how much Quran have you memorized? And he says, just a few surahs. And the Prophet Sallallahu says, marry so and so with the Quran that you have. So it clearly shows here that with this piece of ring that he had, the Prophet ﷺ wanted to give something that had a little bit more meaning, a little bit more value to it. So the Qur'an, of course, was able to provide it. And in addition to that, from this hadith, we also learned something else about the mahr. It doesn't actually have to be a materialistic thing, object that you give. You go to a store, you purchase it, and you give it to your wife. It can also be a service that you provide for her. This companion here was going to provide a service to his wife by teaching her the Qur'an. So literally, sisters out there, you can literally say to your husband, look, my mahar is I want you to cook for me for six months. I don't ever want to be in the kitchen. If he agrees to it, that is a valid mahar. If you say to him, look, I, you know, I want you to cut the grass or mow the lawn or you know, shovel the driveway or something like that, just some kind of service to help around the house for one year, two years, whatever he wants to do, that also counts as a valid mahar. 
it does not have to be limited to money. According to Ibn Qayyim, the strongest opinion is that anything which has value, regardless of whether it be something material or something non-material, can be accepted as a mahar, which is what we're talking about right now. There was even a companion who was going to marry a woman, and the mahar that he was going to give her was actually a pair of shoes. And so the Prophet ﷺ stepped in and asked the woman, are you satisfied that the mahar is going to be a pair of shoes? And the woman responded, yes. And so, subhanAllah, even with that, it had value to her. And so the Prophet ﷺ allowed that. The Prophet ﷺ accepted a man teaching his wife the Qur'an. And this is the, the, uh, the hadith that we quoted to you early. Go, for I have put her under your charge with what you have of the Qur'an. Look at what is given to other women at the time, what is culturally acceptable or befitting of what the family can give. That's the best way to determine the mahr, guys. Is just kind of look at women that are similar to her socially and culturally, and then you can determine a mahar that you think might be good for her, and you can make those kind of suggestions to her. Because what happens is a lot of women don't know exactly what would be a good mahar for her. And some women, you know, and it just happens very, very often, is that they might step over the boundary a little bit. Like, so the poor guy, he probably works at, like, you know, Starbucks or something, and he's just getting by with minimum wage. And then the woman that he's getting married to says, look, I want you to give me $5,000. So that, that's a little bit over his head. I mean, it puts him in a really difficult situation. So in this situation here, he can make certain suggestions to her and say, look, you know, based on my income and what I do and, you know, women similar to the status of, of, of a woman like her, he can make suggestions of, you know, why don't I buy you like, a, you know, an iPod or something or a cell phone or buy you some jewelry. He's allowed to do that. Again, at the end of the day, she has to decide if she wants to agree to that or not. Just keep in mind, the Prophet ﷺ also said, the marriage that has the most barakah is the marriage with the simplest mahar. The marriage that has the most blessing and barakah in it is the marriage that has the simplest and easiest mahar in it. In a second hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says that the greatest women on the face of this earth, nisa, the greatest, most praiseworthy women to walk the face of this earth are the women that make it easy for you to provide, are the women that make for their husbands easy for them to provide for her. So in other words, she's not picky. She doesn't complain about what she has or what she's not getting. She's always content, she's always happy, and whatever the husband can give, it, give to her, provide for her, she's always, alhamdulillah, she's always proud with what her husband and the effort that he's putting forward. This woman, Allah praises her in this world and in the hereafter. So I hope, inshallah, guys, at least that gives you a little bit of um, introduction as to the mahar and at least some of the implications regarding the mahar itself. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to of course put barakah into all of our marriages and those of you who do not have a mahar Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for you to also receive that mahar at any given time bi'ithnillahi ta'ala let's move on to the second subcategory of our discussion today which is of course the mahram the mahram is a person who is forbidden to you for marriage and therefore acts as a guardian and protector. The person can be a mahram due to the following categories, blood relations, in-law suckling, or step relations. So who are your mahram? There's only one verse in the Quran that deals with all of this. Now, this verse here is a very, very detailed verse. It's a verse that, you know, it, it's so detailed that scholars have actually written volumes of discussions and, and, and um, theologies on this particular verse alone. So we're not going to explain each of these categories itself simply because this is not the topic of our discussion. But what we're going to do is we're going to at least list the mahrams that are mentioned in this particular um, verse. So here it says, forbidden to you for marriage are. In other words, because these categories are forbidden, they automatically become your, mah your mahrams. And anyone aside from these categories, of course, are, 
uh, permissible for you to get married to. So here, forbidden for marriage for you are, and we'll just go through them very quickly, is the mother, the daughter, the sister, the mother's sister, the father's sister, so the maternal aunts, the paternal aunts, the brother's daughter, and the sister's daughter, and these of course are the nieces. Now all of this here is uh, relatives or relationship, blood relationship that is permanently prohibited. So forever, until Yawm al they will always be haram for you. Mahrams are, and as, and as you see here on your screen, are temporary and permanent mahrams. A mahram can either be temporary or permanent. All types of mahrams are permanent with the exception of your spouse. When a woman becomes divorced, her ex-husband becomes her non-mahram and therefore must be treated like all her non-mahram relationships. So I think that's something very obvious. However, her father-in-law will always be her mahram, even though she's divorced from his son. Now this here, subhanAllah, imagine what this image looks like, brothers and sisters. Just imagine this. You and your husband got divorced or the marriage was nullified. Imagine now that his father is always going to be your mahram. You have the right to actually pick up the phone one day, and if you need to go for hajj, or you're going for Umrah, you and you don't and you can't find a mahram anywhere else, you can actually call your father-in-law up and say, look, I want you to be my mahram, I want to go for hajj, even though I'm divorced from your son and I hate his guts. Like subhanAllah, imagine how much structure and control our sharia has that it still preserves these outer elements of a marriage. Even though the marriage is broken, there is still that kind of bond or relationship that is still intact. What happens to today? Today when a family breaks or a marriage breaks, what happens in 90% in of the time? You never ever speak to, that, to those in-laws ever again. As a matter of fact, they become your worst enemy. Before they were like mom and dad, and you used to call them mom or dad when you were married to the person. But as soon as a divorce happens, there's absolutely no more communication. It's as if they become a stranger, and subhanAllah, and Allah is clearly telling us that they are still like your own parents, subhanAllah. So non-biological mahrams refers to the stepfather, stepmother, adopted children, adopted parents, etc. The stepmother, once she is married to your father, your stepmother becomes, your perma becomes permanently forbidden to you for marriage, and you become her mahram. So you see this is very straightforward information that we're looking at. The stepdaughter, you become a mahram for your stepdaughter after the marriage contract and consummation of the marriage to your wife has taken place. Let's look at that again. You become the mahram for your stepdaughters after a marriage contract and consummation of the marriage to your wife has taken place. So obviously you know this woman, she has children, daughters from another marriage, and then you know that marriage broke, she came and she married a, another man. So once that marriage is consummated, that's it. So here now, she, uh, he becomes a mahram for your uh, stepdaughters, for his stepdaughters. Adoption and mahrams. A complicated matter. Child needs to be breastfed by the adopted mother for relationship to become lawful. How many times or how does the, the, the suckling work in the sharia? Ah? The child hasn't been suckled as if they were non-mahrams to you. You are a non-mahram to them. Adoptive mother needs to suckle the child at least five times. This is according to the most correct opinion. Scholars differed on this between two times to five times. The majority of scholars took the opinion of five times based on a number of different um, narrations during the time of Prophet ﷺ. They should be suckled in their first two years. The Prophet ﷺ said, suckling forbids from marriage that which is forbidden due to birth. Now, this is really interesting because there was actually two companions that were married for more than 20 years. And later on, the husband found out uh, that the woman that she was married to was actually his sister, it was actually his stepsister. In other words, you know, she was suckled from the same person as he was suckled from. So they were actually sisters and brothers and sisters in that regard. So they went to the Prophet wasallam and they complained to him, you know, Ya Rasulullah, what do we do in this, in this, in this situation? And the Prophet says, how can you remain married 
and it has been said that you are foster brothers and sisters. You know, كَيْفَ وَقَدْ قِيل So this is what Allah Azza wa Jalla, the Prophet is saying, is like, how can I uh, allow this to happen if it's already been said that you both are foster brothers and sisters. And so the marriage was naturally nullified at that moment. After 20 years, they even had children with each other as well and the marriage had to be nullified. So this is really, really something, brothers and sisters, uh, you know, for the most part, it's not something that's very common for us here in the West or in Europe, but this still happens in a lot of um, countries in the Middle East and so on. Ad uh, as we continue, once this has been established, the adopted son becomes the mahram for any other relation that a biological son would have. The same rules apply if you adopt a uh, girl. Let's continue. What age does one become a mahram? Although many people think that mahram needs to be an adult, the majority of scholars are of the view that if the mahram is a boy who has reached the age of discernment and is close to puberty and the woman feels safe when, uh, when, she is with, uh, when he is with her, then that is sufficient. So it's all about maturity, it's all about security, it's all about responsibility. The boy who is close to the age of puberty comes under the same ruling as an adult. However, the best mahram for a woman when traveling is her husband or father as they will be able to protect her properly. In other words, they'll pay attention to all the little things and all the little details and that kind of relationship in and of itself is a protection for her. So having said that, brothers and sisters, before we get to this discussion of the wali, there's a couple things here that we want to mention to close off the discussion of the mahram itself. A lot of people, they ask this question about, you know, certain certain scenarios that happen here like if a student wants to go and travel and they want to travel to like Saudi or to Egypt and they want to just go and study and study Islam and what is the mahram issue here in this particular regard now as you've already seen the purpose of the mahar is to protect and to guard it's to make sure that everything is to make sure that her actual travel is safe and this is why the Prophet says that a woman is never to travel, la tusafir. He tells them, don't travel except that you have mahram with you, except that you have somebody to protect you. Now, some scholars have actually mentioned to take into consideration that if really, truly, a woman must travel, it's the necessity that she must, must travel. Let's say she needs to go to another country to, you know, to save her mom or her father from, you know, you know, a country that's not stable or there's problems there or they're dying and they need her help or something and she needs to get there and it's literally a life and death situation. Scholars, they permit her to travel in cases like this alone. Why? Because they don't lose sight of the fact that traveling today is generally very safe. Every airport that you go to in the world is safe, inshallah. There's security guards, there's police, there's escorts, there's, there's always that level of protection. Traveling today is nothing like traveling back in the days during the time of the Prophet You know, you'd be traveling in the middle of the night, in the middle of the desert. And there's no one there. There could be scorpions, lizards, there could be other mushrikoons and people there all camped in different areas of the desert and they would come and steal and rob for you. It was a very dangerous situation and alhamdulillah today you're sitting in a beautiful comfortable plane, you're going in transit to a beautiful secured airport, everybody who is in there are also travelers that are similar to you, so no strangers from the outside can just walk into the airport and just roam around, the place is monitored 24 hours a day, so it's generally a safe, comfortable environment. So scholars, they say because of that, it is permitted for her to go where she needs to go as long as it is a darura. It is absolutely necessary for her. Now just going, what naturally comes up is this whole issue of Hajj and Umrah. You know, if she wants to go for Hajj and Umrah and she just can't find a mahram anywhere, what does she do? Here again, many scholars have differed on this. And simply because of the verse in Surah Ali Imran, where Allah Azza wa Jal says that if you're able to, then you should go and perform Hajj. Now what does Allah intend by saying if you're able to? Scholars, this is where scholars have differed. Because some scholars have said the mahram is included here. Meaning if you have a mahram, 
then you reach the ability and you have the money, it's safe for you to travel, and then you can go and perform your Hajj or Umrah. Other scholars had said no. The ayah is saying that if you're able to, meaning you have all the conditions and you fulfill all the conditions to go and perform your Hajj and Umrah, but because you don't have a mahram, it shows that you are not able to fulfill that condition and therefore the obligation for you to go and perform Hajj is lifted. In other words, it is not wajib for you to go for Hajj at this point because you have not been able to fulfill the conditions of performing Hajj and therefore because of that, that obligation is lifted. So in other words, you are pardoned. It's not something bad. This is actually something good. What Allah, what, what's, what these scholars are saying is that they recognize, and Allah Himself has recognized that you're not in the position to do to do that. So just continue to live your life and pray and make du'a and ask Allah to make that easy for you. And if it happens, Alhamdulillah, you go for Hajj. But if it doesn't happen and you die in that state and you meet Allah, inshaAllah Allah will still forgive you because Allah says, La yukallifullahu nafsan illa wusaha. You know, Allah will never burden a soul more than it can handle or more than it can bear. So I hope inshaAllah that that is there. However, having said that, by all means, Hajj is a beautiful thing. You know, the brothers and sisters are just, just completed their Hajj. It's a beautiful thing. By all means, if you can go for Hajj and you can uh, sort out the mahram issue, by all means, a lot of groups, a lot of imams and scholars also uh, play this role. This is also according to one other solid opinion that some scholars have allowed a, uh, the, the mahram to also be um, a, a local imam or a local scholar, even a wali uh, for that matter as well. So alhamdulillah, there are some options there uh, at the end of the day. So let's go on to the last and final subtopic of our discussion, brothers and sisters, which is the wali. Now when you hear this word wali, for some people, it just kind of sends shivers down their spine. Ooh, you know, the wali. Who is this wali? And who's allowed to be my wali? And my wali that I have right now is the worst wali in the world. Why does he have to be the wali? I don't even know where my wali is. He could be elder anywhere in the world, and I have no contact with him. So there's so many other external factors and issues that pertain to the wali. So let's look at a game. What is the wali? A wali means a guardian or a protector or a and a custodian. A wali of a woman is a male guardian who is responsible for assessing the marriage proposal and decides in the best interest of the woman. Now we'll pay attention to this second bullet here. A wali of a woman is a male who is responsible for assessing the marriage proposal. That there, if you know, honestly, if you could highlight it somehow, I'd love for you guys to highlight that point because we're going to talk a lot about this point where, as we continue. Walis are firstly blood mahrams. A woman's main wali is usually her father first. So it all starts off from there. This is a right that Allah Azza wa Jal Himself gives to the father. Nobody is allowed to take that away from him. There are very, very few serious cases where that waliship is actually lifted from the father by a judge or a local scholar, which we'll talk about as we continue. A marriage without the consent of a wali is not valid. This is for the protection of the woman. There is no marriage without a wali. لا نكاح إلا بولي. Now, this hadith here that is in Tirmidhi, is Tirmidhi, it's an authentic hadith. Now, this hadith requires some discussion because the reality is, brothers and sisters, is that for many, many couples out there, they they cannot find a wali. And once we and as a, actually, we think we're going to also be talking about some of the criterias and uh, of the wali. So once we get to that discussion, I'm going to tell you that there are certain walis out there that are not qualified to be good walis. They're not qualified to do their job properly. They make really bad decisions for their daughters and or they're really biased to certain issues in that particular engagement. So we're going to talk about that inshallah very, very shortly. Who needs a wali? Women who have never been married and are virgins need their wali's permission to get married. When we say permission, we need meaning they need their guardianship there. So to get that guardianship, literally the wali, a responsible wali, has to approve of this. 
and uh, we'll talk about this shortly. Divorced women who had previous marital relations do not need the permission of their wali. However, the wali still needs to be part of the marriage contract. When we say part of, their presence still needs to be there. So, because what scholars have mentioned here is now, look, you have the woman who has been married before, she's the non-virgin woman, she can basically take care of herself, she has the experience of all the ins and outs of marriage, as opposed to the virgin woman who doesn't know anything about the marriage itself. So for this non-virgin woman here, she's allowed to marry herself off without the permission of her wali. But then it brings a dilemma, because now the Prophet, peace be upon him, he says, there is no nikah except a wali. So how do you put the two together? Scholars, they say that even for the non-virgin um, woman, she should still have a wali present at her nikah. He doesn't have to, she doesn't have to seek permission from him, but his presence is still required, just to kind of generally oversee that and make sure things are, are okay. Men do not need a wali, but they need to ask the wali for a woman. They are interested in marrying for their permission, inshallah. Who can be a wali? Now this is the nitty gritty stuff that I've been talking about, we're going to talk about later. This is it here. For a man to count as a wali, he needs to have the following, religion. In other words, he has to be Muslim. Only a Muslim male can be a wali, a non-Muslim cannot be a wali. Now this also obviously, you know, right off the bat it prevents a problem for um, any reverts that come into Islam who have non-Muslim parents. In this case here you have a couple of options which we're also going to give to you as well. What if you can't find a wali, what do you do? I'm going to take care of you, so just hang in there inshallah. But the, for now, the Muslim uh, man who is a wali, he has to be a religious wali. In other words, he has to have the fundamentals of his religion and understand how to implement those fundamentals. Just because he's Muslim doesn't mean he's qualified to do his job properly. Just because you've gone and you've studied computer programming doesn't mean you know how to perform the job very well. It's one thing to understand the theory behind the science and it's another thing to actually practically implement those sciences implement what you understand and what your knowledge and it's the same case here it's one thing to know your religion very well but to practice it and to implement it and make it a part of your discipline in your life that's a completely different issue so you need a wali that has both basic fundamentals of the deen as well as practicing those fundamentals as well this leads to the second criteria which is fairness and maturity so the walis, this is what we're talking about, we're making bad decisions for their daughters. Saying, well no, you know, he's not from Somalia, he's not from Pakistan, he's not from India, he's not this or not that, he's too short or he's too tall, his job is only, you know, an, a, 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 an engineer, we're looking more for a doctor or a scientist or something. Like subhanAllah, all of these really silly things, and they find every single possible loophole not to make the marriage work because it's just an easier way for them to say, I don't like the guy. Instead of just saying, look, I don't like him, there's something about him I just don't like, what happens is a lot of, a lot of walis, they find the loopholes around this thing. Or they have such high standards for their daughters, it is almost impossible for that daughter to find a person. This is why the Prophet, peace be upon him, once said that if somebody comes to you, it's authentic hadith in a tirmidhi, listen to this hadith guys, because this hadith is really, really profound. The Prophet once said that if a man ever came to your woman, meaning to your daughter, and he proposed for marriage, and he has two things, he has a good religious background, and he has good akhlaq, good morals, good etiquettes, good person, marry them. The Prophet is saying is marry that person. Because if you don't, you will be a source of corruption throughout the land. What this means is that that woman, it will be extremely difficult for her to find somebody better. Because if a man who has religion and he's a good person, if these two qualities about an individual don't appeal to you, then what the Prophet ﷺ is saying here is that nothing else is going to appeal to you. Everything else is going to have an expiration date. He might have a good job, but then tomorrow he, Allah may take that job away from him and he gets fired or he gets laid up and that's gone. But he'll always have his religion and he'll always have his dignity. So that's why the Prophet ﷺ is saying, look, hold on to these two things. Because if these two things can't please you, then you're going to be stuck 
you're not going to find somebody better than that. And even if you do find somebody better than that with better qualities, it's only going to be temporary. What's interesting about this narration is the Prophet focuses on the two qualities that last forever that don't have an expiry date. So whether he's rich or poor, he'll always be religious and have good manners. Whether he has a high status or authority in any position anywhere in his life, it's always going to be that he'll be a religious guy with good etiquette. So this is extremely important for the wali to look at this and be very careful that he finds, once he finds these two categories, two characteristics about the person, that he should really strongly consider that person for marriage for their daughters. Puberty, of course, is the maturity uh, factor and faculty of sense, so this should be sensible enough to make good decisions. He also needs to fulfill his duties of a wali by finding the best and most righteous spouse for her. Remember, listen to the words, finding the spouse for her, not forcing her to marry the most you know, suitable spouse. It is haram for somebody to force a woman or force a man or anybody for that matter to get married to somebody that they don't um, approve of. Allah Azza wa Jal even tells us this in the Quran, لا يحل لكم أن تريث النساء كرها. Allah says in Surah An-Nisa, I don't permit you to inherit the women even if they dislike that. What it means here is that there was once upon a time where women was, were actually just considered objects that you can inherit them, place a value on, on them as well. So subhanAllah, it's a really dirty practice, you know, if the father dies or the son dies, the sister or, or, or the wife, they could be inherited for a particular value and be sold for that value as well. So Allah is saying, don't do this, it's haram and I forbid you from this, so Islam came and destroyed this practice. But what's interesting about this is, the, is there's another wisdom to look at it beyond what it's talking about. Don't inherit the women, in other words, don't force them to be in a situation that they're going to dislike. Karha, karha literally comes from the word makru, which means something you hate. So the woman, if she hates to be inherited, if she hates to go under the responsibility of somebody she doesn't like to be with, Allah says this is haram. So the same wisdom is applied to the marriage. Don't force a woman to marry somebody she doesn't want. The most obvious, obvious response to even this, even without any ayah, without any hadith, is just common sense. How can she live with somebody she doesn't love? she's not attracted to? How can he fall in love with somebody that he himself is not attracted to and he doesn't have that love and mercy and compassion for her? How are they supposed to provide for each other and look out for each other if initially they had no attraction whatsoever? So finding the best spouse is a duty but forcing that is not his duty, that is a choice between the, husband, the daughter and the, and, the, and the potential. Accepting the proposal of someone that has good religion and manners and not refuse her wish to get married if the person is suitable. So all these things are considered as well. What about revert sisters or those who do not have a uh, wali? A wali must be a Muslim. So we talked about this. Therefore, sisters who are reverts cannot use their fathers as their walis unless they are Muslim. Instead, sisters should appoint the local imam sheikh to be their wali. Now, just before we go to the third point, for the reverts out there, just because your father is not Muslim doesn't mean that you completely exclude him and you tell him, look, dad, you have nothing to do with my wedding and who, who I choose because you're not Muslim, so you can't be my wali. And they're going to just be like sitting there and be like, what? What are you talking about? I'm, I'm your dad. You have to put yourself in your father's shoes for a moment. And you have to understand that they don't know from an Islamic perspective how you as their daughter is thinking now at this moment. You've made the choice to become Muslim, alhamdulillah. But Allah says in the Quran, وَصَاحِبُهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفَ Still be good to your parents in the materialistic, in the world, in this dunya, in your lifestyle in this world. So, maybe your father who is not Muslim cannot play the waliship or the guardianship of your marriage, but he can certainly, he certainly has to be pleased with and be happy with the person you're getting married. Because at the end of the day, he's still got to live with this person who married his daughter. He's still got to have to have a relationship with him. 
So you have to try to consider his feelings when you choose somebody. Get him involved in at least the logistics of the marriage. You know, Dad, when do you think would be a good time to get married? Should we have a summer wedding? Should we have a winter wedding? Dad, you want to go and help me pick out the foods for the wedding? Dad, you want to help me pick out some of the decorations? Keep him involved. Don't just exclude him because simply he's not Muslim. This is not what Allah has ordered us to do so. Allah has ordered us, sure, when it comes to Islamic things, when it comes to those decisions, yes, Allah puts conditions behind it. But the rest of your life and how you live, don't just throw him and kick him to the curb because, kick him to the curb because at the end of the day, sisters, this is your dad. And at the end of the day, you love your father. Whether he's Muslim or not, you still love him. You still have that natural connection with him. You're still going to go up to him for some advice. If you have problems in your marriage, you're still going to go back to your dad and be like, Dad, you know, he doesn't listen to me or he really treats me bad. What should I do? The father might actually say to you, well, you know what? You know what, my daughter? Just be a good girl. You know, just listen to him. Just give him a chance. He might actually give you some quote-unquote good nasiha. So you want to try to keep him at least involved from that perspective. Um, if that's not an option, then of course the Imam, the Sheikh, the Wali. Wallahi, we need an entire webinar just to talk about qualified Imams and Sheikhs to play the Waliship of the daughters. Because even now, just because he's an Imam or a Sheikh, again, doesn't mean that he qualifies to be a good Wali. I can tell you, and I'm sure many of you listening out there know this, that there are so many Imams that have been appointed those positions just simply because they came from a particular family, they're part of a particular tribe, they cater to a particular audience, but it's not because of their knowledge and their wisdom and understanding. So a lot of Imams don't even have the fiqh and understanding of implications of marriage and divorce. They don't even know. You might go up to them and you can talk to them about, look, what do I do if I don't have a mahar? What if my husband agreed on a mahar and then my husband died and he hasn't given me the mahar? What should I do? Where should I get the mahar? You'll be surprised how much Iran's have no clue what to do in these situations. So it's extremely important that you go to a qualified imam. Sisters who do not have a wali, orphans or no male family, will also need to appoint a local imam or sheikh to be Become their wali. The same rules apply. Your marriage is invalid without a wali, and not having a wali is not an excuse to be married without one. So, just because you don't have a guardian over you doesn't mean that, okay, khalas, you know, I can just go and get married. I hope by now, brothers and sisters, you all see the wisdom of why Allah has legislated and decreed that there should be a guardian for her. Because just think about the nature of a woman. Think about her tenderness in her personality. Think about you know, the softness and the gentleness of how easily she might be persuaded to believing that something is really there when it's really not. Because a woman depends on her father to take care of her and to provide for her and to look after her because she's been raised in that kind of environment she's going to look for the same thing in that potential husband she's going to look for that husband that's going to be responsible it's going to take care of her it's going to provide all of these things for her and kind of give her that father-daughter feel in her marriage and sometimes as a matter of fact many times a woman is persuaded to believe that something is really there when it's really not because the reality is very simple. There is a lot of men out there who are very good at manipulating the wives to making them think that they are really somebody which they're not. And unfortunately for the women because of their innocent nature, some of the men, they prayed over this. They took advantage of that. So the woman, she got convinced. She's like, my God, I'm going to marry this religious guy. You know, he's got this kind of job. He's got that, that, that kind of job. So they get married. She gets a car. She needs insurance. She needs gas money. She needs repair bills, this and that. And the guy's like, I don't care. You go deal with it yourself. It's your car. So she's stuck now. She has to run back to daddy. She has to go find a job. She has to go and go to the masjid. And it just creates one huge problem. That is the responsible of the wali. That's why he's there. He's honestly, at the end of the day, he's just looking out for her to make sure that she's going to be okay. Again, the only concession that is that of a uh, divorced woman. But remember, the wali must be present at the time of nikah. What if a wali does not fulfill his duties as a wali? One of the great scholars by the name of Sha'ru Thaymeen, he says, look at the following. 
if a woman's guardian prevents her from marrying a suitable partner of good religion and character, then her guardianship is transferred to the next in line for guardianship amongst her relatives. If all of her guardians in succession refuse, as is usually the case in these matters, then guardianship transfers to the Islamic judge who facilitates the marriage. It is the duty of the judge to get the woman married once the matter comes before him and he knows of her guardian's refusal. This is because the judge has general jurisdiction over the matter once the specific jurisdiction of her blood relatives is annulled. Again, in our times we probably don't have this option. Uh, most of us out there, we don't have this option of an Islamic judge. So even Sheikh Uthaymeen himself also gives a third step beyond that, which is, generally speaking, a qualified local imam can also play this role as well. What if a wali does not fulfill his duties as a wali? The jurist mentioned that if the wali repeatedly refuses a woman's qualified suitors, his character is deemed sinful and this disqualifies his guardianship. So you see what happens here? He's not making good decisions. He doesn't know what he wants for his daughter, so he's disqualified. In fact, many scholars are of the opinion that the right of such a man to lead others in prayer is even nullified. So SubhanAllah, look at how far this goes. Some people whom Allah has entrusted with guardianship refuse to allow the woman under their care to marry qualified suitors. The problem is compounded by the fact that many young women are too shy or scared to say anything or to approach the Sharia court. You see what I'm talking about now uh, earlier when we mentioned because of her innocent nature, how easily it is for people to take advantage of her. This is why you need a good, strong, mature and qualified wali to be there. Having said that, brothers and sisters, We've talked about the mahar, we've talked about the mahram, and we've talked about the wali. Three comprehensive, huge topics, alhamdulillah. We were able to compound them in this short discussion with all of you. So in conclusion, brothers and sisters, Allah has placed multiple forms of protection for the women in Islam. You know, one of these days, inshallah, perhaps we might just have a, a webinar on the blessings and the honor of a wife and a mother and a woman the Qur'an. Because, wallah, you know, sometimes I've said this before, when I read the Qur'an, and if I go from the Qur'an from cover to cover, I sometimes get this feel from the Qur'an that it was written and it was sent down just for the women alone. Because of how much attention Allah Azza wa Jal gives to the woman, even subhanallah when she goes through her contractions giving birth to a child even that Allah addresses in the Quran even before all of this the moment that she finds out that she's pregnant she goes to the doctor she gets a blood test and she finds out look I'm pregnant Allah addresses those moments in the Quran Surah Al-A'raf so subhanallah the nature of how a woman is discussed in the Qur'an is something that can never be fully exhausted. The mahar is a very important part of the marriage contract and cannot be disregarded as it is the woman's right. Her protectors and guardians have a very serious responsibility to uphold this and they shouldn't take it lightly. And the mahrams and walis should not abuse their rights over the woman under their care as there are severe consequences to this. And I think those consequences, alhamdulillah, have been highlighted through this discussion today. Having said that, brothers and sisters, Jazakumullahu khairan. May Allah Azza wa Jal reward all of you for joining us here today once again. I don't know how many webinars we've done together, but alhamdulillah, we've done a lot. And like I said, we are just scratching the surface of what is to come for all of you. This is our duty and our responsibility that we want to provide a platform for all of you to make your marriages easy, to make them filled with barakah. And even those who are not married, we're here for you to facilitate an avenue that inshallah you guys can find a good, righteous spouse and move forward in your life and live happily ever after. Because you know something? You all deserve to live happily ever after. So I hope with this discussion and all of the other webinars out there, we hope that we've been able to make your life somewhat easier and more uh, fruitful for you. And as Sister Alpha in the beginning of the uh, webinar mentioned, please, please make sure that you add pure matrimony under the interest 
uh, that you have so that you can receive all of the feeds and the announcements and everything, all of the postings from purematrimony.com. You can also keep up to date with what's coming and so on. Like I said, we have some fantastic 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 things coming your way insha'Allah ta'ala so having said that I will turn it back to uh, our sister Arfa Jazakumullahu khayra wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Jazakumullahu khayran shaykh that was uh, subhanallah very very insightful wonderful presentation alhamdulillah I've just you know, it just amazes me that there is just so much depth to what needs to be learned. And, you know, like you said, we're only just scratching the surface, surface of exactly what needs covering. Um, brothers and sisters, please, you know, make sure that you are keeping in touch with us through our Facebook pages. As the Sheikh has mentioned, inshallah, we've got some amazing things coming up. Um, definitely before the end of this year, we are looking at doing some pretty fantastic things including a uh, dedicated course on marriage so that's a, that's a big announcement there mashallah and I'm not going to really reveal any more inshallah you're just going to have to look out for it on Facebook inshallah um, so for those of you who want to register for a life partner in a halal and safe environment you know please we do uh, say to you that you know if you have a wali you want to bring your wali along inshallah there is really no better place than domatrimony.com mashallah it's absolutely fantastic we, we are getting literally two people per week are getting married on average through purematrimony.com so if you haven't really checked that out yet you know make sure that you do um, again the details are www.purematrimony.com now we do have a lot of questions Sheikh I have to say I think of all the webinars that we've had uh, so far this one has probably generated the most amount of questions so let's get stuck right in because I am conscious of the time as well um, okay. so the first question very interesting question actually Mm -hmm. Sister has asked, uh, my mahar was to perform hajj with my husband within the first two years of marriage. Unfortunately, the divorce took place before the hajj took place. Um, I have now completed my idda and my husband did not pay my maintenance during the idda and has still failed to uphold my mahar. Um, but as the hajj has now passed, um, you know, has my mahar been denied to me? Please advise. Okay. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ba'd. The mahar can never be disqualified. It can never be thrown out. In other words, that even if it's hajj, if the husband could not provide a hajj package for you after the divorce, cannot even pay for that, what he should do is to give you something that was equivalent to the value of going for hajj. Something has to be given there to you. This is what his responsibility is towards you. Now if there's any like financial issues with him on his side that he can't afford to do this for you anymore, then it's up to the sister's discretion as the wife, uh, or the former wife in this case, to decide of something that could be simple and easy for him, and she is also pleased with it as well. At the end of the day, the point of this question here is, is that she still has control over her mahar. Just because the divorce happens, it doesn't matter. Because once they've agreed on this divorce, uh, sorry, once they've agreed on this mahar, it still has to be fulfilled, either equivalent to the value of that mahar or the actual mahar itself. Something has to be given. Uh, the final thing I'll mention is that because you know it's a divorce and what happens often it's very difficult to negotiate or to agree on these things now at this point if the husband says I don't care I'm not giving you nothing just get out of my life and stay where you are and just says no 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 for the sister I would encourage you to just fight it in your heart to let it go because this will be something that Allah will raise him and account him for it will never be let it go. It will never be something that will be thrown out the window. Allah will resurrect him and will account him for that responsibility. In the meantime, inshaAllah, I pray that if you don't get the mahar or the value of, may Allah Azza wa Jal replace it with something more valuable in your life, inshaAllah. Um, can a sister ask um, for sadaqa as mahar? Um, to be given to a charity so I guess what the sister here is saying um, because it was quite a long question so I do apologize, so I do apologize. a very lengthy one um, 
the sister is basically explaining that um, the, the husband that she was going to marry, she's requested for Sadhana to be given instead to a charity and he provided the receipt um, as proof that he did that. Is that permissible? This is actually something very disliked for, for her to do. Uh, can you hear me, Sister Alpha? Yes, I can. Sorry about that. Yes, okay. No problem. Um, so in, to this question here, this is actually something very disliked. What should happen is that she should actually have something in her hand that she has control over. And if she wants to give that in charity, let that be a duty on, her, on herself. Because Allah says in the Quran to give the women this. Allah doesn't say that to give it to something else or to someone else on behalf of the women. This is something that has to be directly given to her and then she can do whatever she wants with it after. Now having said that, if this has already been said and done, it's fine. May Allah Azza wa Jal forgive us. But what should have happened was she should have just requested however, whatever the amount is that she wants to give in charity, she should have gotten it from him first and then she can decide if she wants to give it in charity or if she wants to keep it. It's all up to her. My point here is the woman, you have control over this mahar and you can do whatever you want with it. So you have to make sure that you gain that control and then you can make these um, decisions later on. Okay, Jazakum Allah khairan. Um, somebody's asking, can mahar be given in installments? Yes, mahar can be given in installments and there is one condition for this and the condition is that the woman has to agree on those installments. So if he says to her, look, I'll pay you 5,000 pounds or 5,000 dollars and I'll give it to you in the span of 10 years. And if she says, no, 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 10 years, 5,000 dollars, you give it to me in 5 years. See here what happened? She didn't agree on this. So if that is there, the condition, the installment is not agreed upon. She has to be satisfied with those installments. So yes, they can do that. They do have that option. But like I said, the most important thing is to agree upon it. Just to add to this, it is also encouraged that if you're going to get a mahar in installments, then to put it in an actual marriage contract. Make sure that it's written down in a marriage contract and it's signed. So that way there is not, there's no ambiguity later on. Okay, um, who can be the mahram for a convert who is the only Muslim in their family? So this is um, something that we discussed in the webinar. So the refer to, and she is the only Muslim in the entire um, family. family. Yeah, she's allowed to go to a local imam or scholar. Now, when we say local imam or scholar, this is the closest qualified imam who can play that role as the wali. She's allowed to do that. Well, uh, sorry, uh, Sheikh, um, uh, yeah. apologies. The question's not about a wali, it's about mahram. Mm -hmm. So I think the sister's oh, asking, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I got you. So she doesn't have anyone here, even for a mahram, even her um, local sheikh or local scholar can also be the mahram for her. Okay. But it all depends on the, per the, the purpose of her travels or whatever it is that she wants to do. Because as we mentioned in the webinar, we talked about the hajj and umrah. There are some group leaders that can play this role. And, and these are only isolated situations. So really for this sister here, no other option is there for her. She is allowed to look at somebody in that particular case if she wishes to go for Hajj. However, just to keep in mind as we mentioned to you that whole Hajj thing, even if she doesn't have a maharit, that responsibility could even be lifted on her. So anything in general, it has to be something very, very serious. And like I said, a local sheikh or imam can qualify to play that role for her. Okay, inshallah, jazakum Allah khairan. Um, a sister is asking, she's saying, my parents are divorced and my father doesn't support us financially. Is he still qualified to be my wali as he is not religious at all? This here is something, I mean, the question makes sense, but the decision behind the question needs to have somebody, uh, like a third party involved. So, 
even if the parents are divorced, the, the father is making bad decisions for the daughter, that in and of itself is a reason for him not to be a wali anymore. But she has to have some kind of affirmation behind all of this. So what she'll have to do is she'll have to go to um, a local masjid or scholar again, and she has to present this as a case to him and say, look, I want to get married, but my father is this and he's that, and he's not doing this, he's not doing that. So what that imam is going to do now is that either he will appoint someone else on the father's behalf to be the wali or he's going to play that role himself. So he can say, okay, well, do you have a brother? And if she says yes, then he says, look, on behalf of your father, I will write down and I will appoint your brother to be your wali and you can move forward with that. So at the end of all of this, she has to present her case in front of a quote-unquote judge and this imam or scholar will judge the case and he will make a solid decision for her. The reason why I say that is very simple. For the daughter, don't make this decision on your own. Even though you know your father better than any other sheikh or imam would, don't make a religious sharia decision on your own without the guidance of somebody who is um, well trained in the sharia. No. Um, a sister is asking, um, she is divorced and she wants to know, is it permissible to speak to a potential spouse without the presence of her wali? Okay, if she's divorced, she is basically allowed to do anything that she wants. And by that I mean, she is allowed to pursue another marriage. She is allowed to speak to somebody as well without the permission of the wali. However, again, his presence should be there. Now here, it's just a discussion. You're just talking, getting to know each other or whatever. Um, in this case here, there are strict guidelines because in and of itself, talking to somebody of the opposite gender is very, very, um, it's a very delicate issue in our Sharia. It requires strict guidelines and has to be monitored very carefully by both parties. But for the non-virgin woman, in this particular case, she doesn't need the permission of the wali, but he needs to be aware of what's happening. He should be at least aware of where the conversation is going, who the guy is, and at least be able to act as a second or third party in case things go the wrong way. In case she's being manipulated, in case things don't sound right, he's there to, inshallah, oversee all of those issues. So it's kind of like a yes or no to the question. Yes, sir, um, she needs the wali. Uh, present, but no, she doesn't actually have to go and seek his permission to do so. Okay, Jazakumullah khairan, Sheikh. Um, interesting question here. Um, a Reva sister is asking that uh, before she accepted Islam, uh, she was previously divorced. So now her question mm -hmm. is, do I still need a wali? Okay, there's two ways to look at this scenario. The first way is to really treat it as though she is a Muslim in the sense that you, prov you, you attach the same ruling for a Muslim woman who was previously married and wishes to, wishes to get married again. You can give her the same ruling. And what is that ruling? That yes, she can go and marry without a wali. Or the second way to look at this is very simple. When she took her shahada, all of her previous sins have been forgiven. Everything in, in her past has been wiped out from her, so she is like a brand new, a uh, newborn child, if you'd like. So physically, she might not be um, like the virgin woman, but spiritually, she is counted as a pure woman. So she should have her wali there. So I hope that makes sense. It's actually a very beautiful thing. Wallahi, it's one of the most beautiful things about our Sharia, how much care it puts over the situation. So she basically has two choices here. What I would encourage her to do is put both of the choices together, and that is she can make the decision on her own to, to find another spouse and to get married, but at the same time have the wali ship there to oversee her affairs. Don't exclude a wali at all. So even if she doesn't have one, she should at least try to get one, inshallah. Okay, Jazakumal Khairan. A couple more questions, Sheikh, and then inshallah we will conclude. Um, a brother here has mentioned okay. that Ibn Tahmiya, rahimullah, has mentioned that Imam Ahmed uh, man implied that it is mushtahab for the mahar to be 400 dir dirhams. Is this true? 
this here, in terms of the mahar amount, the reason why Imam Ahmed, as a matter of fact, there's a quite a few scholars that stipulated certain amounts of, um, or put an actual value over the mahar. The reason for this is that during the time of the Prophet Sallam, the mahar was actually quite expensive in the sense that you know you had some companions that gave 500 dirhams, 600 dirhams, 400 dirhams and the Prophet ﷺ encouraged this. Listen to the words very carefully for the questioner especially. The Prophet ﷺ encouraged us as the husbands to give a good and if you like to call it expensive mahr to the woman. Why again? Because this is a gift from her, from Allah to her, and it is something that she should feel some luxury and comfort behind it. This is something that, again, it's a blessing and barakah that Allah gives to her. Imam Ahmed holds the opinion very firmly, and it's a very solid opinion, so don't get me wrong, it's a very good opinion, that it should be equivalent to the value of 400 dirhams, which is like a few hundred dollars, right? So it's a pretty expensive mahar. The reason why Imam Ahmed did that is to preserve the sanctity of the, the mahar itself. In other words, not to devalue the mahar in any way. The mahar is something so precious that Imam Ahmed wants to preserve that sacredness of the mahar. And this is why he says the minimum it should be is 400. Imam al-Shafi'i gives a higher value than that. The other imams and other scholars, even Ibn Taymiyyah himself gives a higher value than that. So this is why until this day we don't have an actual solid amount of how a mahar should be. So the, the response to that is there is no minimum, there is no maximum, but the mahar should present a level of luxury and comfort for the wife, inshallah. Um, a sister is saying that she has a 10 year old son and she's a single mother and she wishes to go for Umrah. Um, she wants to know will her son count as her mahram? Is he old enough for her to be traveling alone with him? Okay. Now, this is something we touched on it very briefly in, in, in the discussion today. And that is the mahram who has not attained the age of maturity. This here, according to the majority of ulama, this person, a, 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 a boy who hasn't reached that at, uh, age of puberty or maturity, does not qualify as a mahram. Then the reason is very simple. The level of responsibility and maturity is not there yet for, this, for a 10-year-old child. It's not there. They wouldn't be able to make certain decisions and provide a strong level of security for, especially somebody who is more mature than him. As a matter of fact, the mother in this case plays a stronger, if you would like, mahram role to the 10-year-old child. She actually protects him more than he can ever protect her. She actually looks out for his affairs more than he can ever do for her. So this here is not necessarily restricted to a Islamic decision of just filling in the mahram role. It's much more than that. So what I'm saying is that you have an entire, um, an entire complete uh, pie, if you'd like, or cake. Don't just take a piece of that cake and work with that. You need to take the entire cake itself. So part of that cake is that, yes, he's a male. But the rest of the cake shows that he's not mature enough to play the role as the mahram yet. So for this, to answer the question then at this point is of course no, the 10 year old child cannot play the role of the mahram at this point. He's fulfilled at least one of the conditions. He may love the mother and want to do everything for her, but you know, Islamically looking at the entire image itself, it is not something that is recommended by, or by the scholars and Allah knows best. Now we are going to have to conclude um, My apologies to everyone who didn't get their questions answered SubhanAllah I've literally got about 30-40 questions here It just goes to show it's, you know, it's such a huge topic MashaAllah So um, Sheikh, uh, we are going to have to finish there I'm afraid So JazakAllah again for an excellent explanation On what can be a very confusing topic And for everyone who feels that they are ready to take the plunge And find their ideal practicing soulmate I would highly encourage everyone to sign up with Pure Matrimony 
which has already mentioned is the world's largest site for practicing Muslims. Alhamdulillah, we have a very simple ethos in trying to help as many people as possible fulfill half of their deen with a 100% halal, sophisticated and Sharia compliant way of finding a spouse. Um, so please go ahead and go to www.purematrimony.com. You can also find out more about us on our Facebook, Twitter and other social media channels. Um, Finally, I just want to conclude by mentioning that don't forget that your Salah is the cornerstone upon which all of your good deeds are built upon. So please make sure that you check out SalahTimes.com as well and make sure you like their Facebook page too. Um, Sheikh Musleh, how can people contact you please? The easiest way for everyone to contact me is just uh, get, on, get in touch with me on my fan page. So um, it's right in front of your screen if you guys are still there. Or you can just go onto your Facebook, just type in Muslah Khan, and you'll see my fan page is there. And you make sure you hit the like button. And once you hit the like button, inshallah, you can drop in your questions into the inbox, and inshallah, I will get to them over time. I want to thank everyone for attending tonight's webinar, inshallah. And most of all, I want to thank Sheikh Muslim today for his wonderful wisdom, alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for all of us to find a righteous spouse and perfect half of our deen according to the Quran and the Sunnah. Until next time, I wish you all the very best. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.